Hi guys, I'm Mia Barone. I am the host of Ask a Little Tell a Little podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining me. The podcast is all about being inspiring. I want to inspire you and motivate you to do positive things. So check me out on any of the listening platforms. Search Ask a Little Tell a Little wherever you get your podcast. Also, thank you for joining my YouTube channel. You can hit the subscribe button to see upcoming episodes. Hey everybody, welcome back and thanks for listening. I am so excited right now. As everybody knows, it's the spooky season and I have a guest today, which I'm blown away that this man would come on and talk to us and tell us all his things and experiences that he's gone through. I have Barry Fitzgerald from Ghost Hunters International with me today and he's going to scare us. So Barry, how are you? I'm very good, Maya. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. So tell everybody who you are, a little bit about your background, because you are a paranormal researcher, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, so um, t- tell me how you got into that. Well, um, I, I've been involved in the field now for over 30 years. And I, I think initially, I think even as a child, um, many people who become involved in the field uh, through the research do so by something that may have happened in their youth. Yeah. And I was no different. You know, I, I grew up in a house that um, years later, my, my, my father and mother tell me that there were stories associated with that house. And hmm. um, my mother was seeing some things in the house as well, a, a figure. And, uh, and then eventually as a child, I got to see that figure for myself. However, my experience was slightly different because it was Christmas Eve. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and of course, my initial instinct was, I'm caught. It's Santa. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, not going to get any presents this year, and uh, so I hightailed it back to bed, not knowing what exactly it was I saw. And my my child's mind just immediately went to it's the middle of the night, it's Christmas Eve, it's Santa coming right. up the stairs. Right. And it was not Santa. Right. So it didn't really scare you because you were like, oh no, I'm just not getting presents. You know, you know, um, I, I think at at the time it frightened me because of the fear of not getting any any presents. Uh-huh. But you know, when when you actually strip that away, it is a strange person mm-hmm. figure in in the house. Whether right. it be Santa, um, it right. doesn't make any difference. Um, who is this guy, Santa? <laughs> right. Know, why right. am I being pushed to accept this guy? Right. And so you know, so so that was that was a that was one of the the cornerstones, I think. Um, that led me on on the research field. You know, it's interesting because I think that a lot of people actually experience these things. And I am one of these people who have experienced things and I just push it away because I'm too afraid. Um, Right. And it's happened in my house that I have lived in right now where things just randomly Mm -hmm. fall in a different room. and, And it's always in one room. And... I don't know anything about this house and I don't know anything about this area. I don't know if there was things that went on or if there was something that, you know, a lot of times people talk about, you know, even Native American sites where people had died or war sites and things like that. I don't know anything about that with this house. But Mm -hmm. in this specific room, one of the, the scariest things that happened was my husband and I were in bed sleeping and we heard this really loud bang. And him and I, I was a police officer and he is military. So we went out with our guns because it sounded like someone had kicked in the door and we went into the other room and there was a, a guitar that was up against the wall, leaning like this and it fell like this. So it didn't fall like to the side or like it, like it would have naturally to where it would have just slipped and fell. It fell forward, which was weird that it was just not a natural thing that it did that. Mm -hmm. And of course, because I'm too afraid, I'm like, that's not a real thing. I can't, I can't Mm -hmm. believe Mm -hmm. that there's something going on in this house and it's kind of slowed down and stopped, but there's been nothing that seems demonic or anything like that. But 
that must have been scary as a child. You're right. Santa Claus is kind of a weird thing to think about, too, that there's a random man in your house. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's, it, that's... It really is. That on the Tooth Fairy. Yeah. There's another bizarre one as well, you know? Yeah, that's kind of creepy to think that there's just a random person in your house. So it's <laughs> it started it started there for you. And how did that really evolve into adulthood? And like, this is what I want to do and figure this out. Yeah, um, I, I came across um, a book by John A. Keel. I was always interested in the mysteries, the Bermuda Triangle and, and all of that stuff. And I came across a book by John A. Keel. Um, who is one of my, my, my top people that, uh, that I think are absolute classics within the field. And he, he wrote a book called Jadu, which was about his experiences uh, leaving the, the, uh, the, the army in Germany and traveling the world and going looking at these mysteries within mm -hmm. India, the, the Himalayas, um, and, and things like that. And it was absolutely fascinating. After reading that, that was it. I was hooked. And... I can remember. I can remember when when I, I left school and and uh, I went into uh, I went into a job. The uh, the guy there said to me, "What is it that you really want to do with your life?" And and I said, "I'd love to be Indiana Jones." And we yeah. laughed it off. <laughs> Little did I know what life had planned for me. Um, I t I think I turned into an Irish Indiana Jones. Um, <laughs> and I've I've been in in caves and tombs and everything else. Um, since right around the world, chasing all this stuff. That's so crazy because that's everybody's dream, I think, to grow up and be Indiana Jones. But that's really yeah. awesome that you had those opportunities to do that. Tell me a little bit about how, did you study about this? Did you study, because there's different equipment and things that you need to use. Did you study about how to do these things? What did you do to prepare yourself to go in and actually get you know, paranormal readings or, or be able to find these places? I think there, there was, yes, there is, there is a, an initial um, education that, that uh, someone who really wants to seriously delve into this needs to start with. Um, and, and reading is going to be the best way to do that. And, and then from there, it, it really, it really evolved from there. And, and, and I became, involved with several different groups um, and move forward with that. So I was dipping my toes in the water uh, and seeing how the phenomena operated within the field and, and observing it. And like, like many science, good science starts with observation. Right. And, and this field is no different. And, and it can be very, very difficult to get it to do the same thing over and over and over and and I absolutely um, sympathize if there are any spirits out there with with groups of folks coming in with voice recorders and saying the same question over and over again. What's your name? Yeah, yeah, they're just <laughs> like, uh... um, but it's, it's a very, very tough field. Um, it's very physically demanding. It's demanding on relationships. Um, if this if this is your calling, well, by all means, go for it, but uh, but be careful and and, and take um, steady steps. Yeah, because it's not to be toyed with. There right, are, there are things that can happen. You know, that's one of the things that I've always said, and I think that's why I push it away so much, is because I grew up Catholic, and mm -hmm. in Catholicism, demons are really a real thing, and it's not something to play with, and that's a very terrifying thing for me to welcome or to call those things into my life. So that's always a scary situation when I talk about seeing things or hearing things that, you know, may be paranormal. I am always afraid to kind of invite that into my life. Do you feel yeah. like you, you have a good handle on separating the demonic type spirits from spirits who are just trying to communicate you see uh, mia it gets very very complicated very quickly mm -hmm. especially when you when the, the likes of myself I, I i look at what's happening in, in in the modern context and then follow the pattern back down through history and eventually end up in the in the textbooks 
um, and back into the manuscripts, understanding where these things have come from. Now you mentioned, of course, the demonic aspect, and um, there are certain things that have happened um, that that have taken the old gods, for instance, and and through some good old good old uh, uh, spinning of uh, of some of the the truths we have ended up with a certain uh, situation where we have the demons that evolved from demons, the Greek yeah. demons. Um, so, and, and those in themselves weren't necessarily good or bad. Um, and and the likewise, we can also see that as well with, with um, the angelic presence mm -hmm. because the church never bothered with angels until the fifth century. And um, so before then it was, yeah, whatever. And until the 17th century, we're the ones that give them wings. Hmm. So and nowadays we, we, we're in a situation where if we track it back, we find that angels actually weren't referred to until 586 BC. And we know the very man that created them and they were developed from Babylonian planetary gods. So before then, there were no angels. We created them. And that has become a problem because now you know we're in a situation now within 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 uh, our our different faiths and everything else we're calling on things and we really should be questioning where they're coming from right and this goes right across the board this is not just um, um picking on on one particular faith or whatever the case may be this is right across the board we need to be careful what we're asking in to help us move forward um and uh, yeah so that in itself um, you tend to spend a lot of your time in the old textbooks yeah. tracking a lot of this stuff back and seeing where the twists and turns have occurred. That makes a lot of sense, but I'm sure that could be very difficult because what if things were reported wrong or what if things were documented? You know, you have to just blindly almost believe the things that happened way back when because none of us were there. Hmm. And that in itself, that's where we come into the modern state. And, and when we finally do get to interact with, with something from beyond, you have a great connection with your own instinct and understanding our own biology because the, the human skin itself is the largest organ in the body. And, and that processes information. We're able to see that through laboratory tests that it will process information and if it does not like like if, if we walked you into a into a room and blindfolded you if if you walked in there and there was something that your body was picking up that you didn't like the hair then would stand on the back of your neck and the adrenaline would be released your fight or flight would be engaging at this mm -hmm. particular point now visually you're gone. That, that main that main aspect of sight is, is 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 missing. So how else then are we gauging what is in there? Mm. Um, if we if we look at, at real estate, you know, seventy five percent of houses are sold on feeling. Well, what is that feeling? Yeah. When you walk into a plain white room and we say, "Oh, I like this. This is nice. I like this." Or, "No, I don't like this." Yeah. What is that feeling that we're picking up on? That is the seat of our instinct. That is our fight or flight. That is the best instrument that we have in the field because it doesn't matter what image this thing appears at, it's how we interpret that interaction. It's how our body signals to us, this ain't right, get ready to move. It's lying to you It's it's or it's telling the truth. The same can be said for, for the likes of Homeland Security, for instance. Um, Homeland Security have been exceptionally successful, especially by guards who were going by their instinct. Yes. I, I don't like what you're telling me. Yes. That is the instinct that yes. we're tapping into. That in itself has, has paid out dividends way beyond yes. the multi-million dollars that have been spent on trying to develop equipment that will do the job. Yes. So that in itself, is, is, there's a huge amount to be said for the human body itself and how it interacts with the greater environment. That, and, uh, I, I, that I, love, I love that because I am such a big 
advocate for intuition. I'm, and it's, it's interesting mm-hmm. that you connected it that way because I would have never connected it that way. But you are 100% right. Mm-hmm. Being in law enforcement, my best tool was my intuition. And I was probably yeah. 95% cr- right. And I might not have known mm-hmm. what it was, but yes. the feeling was 95% right the majority of the time on is this person have is there something going is there something going to happen is there something going on i can feel things from people that is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yes that makes total sense very interesting i've never thought of it that way but yes that makes total sense but do you think that i guess i guess it would depend on what you feel about paranormal or about beyond or spirit worlds and things like that as far as whether or not you're accepting of it that not everything is bad because i feel like somebody could could hear something see something and be scared of it and maybe it's really not a scary thing well that in itself that's that's where i that's where I, i i direct people back to is the initial instinct how does the body react? Because that's exceptionally important. That should override anything. That's how the yeah. body reacts. That is your first indicator. After that, then we can go on and, and deal with what needs to be done. If we have something, for instance, that comes forward and says it's great, great aunt Margaret, for instance, um, and, uh, and we continue to work with this, what I've tended to find is that when great, when great aunt Margaret comes forward, little tidbits that we go, oh, it is Aunt Margaret. I'm usually the one that's on the back foot saying, wait, wait. Because sooner or later, Great Aunt Margaret will trip up and will start giving us a lie or misdirection. And uh, that deception is something which is exceptionally um, um, destructive in, in its own right. And we need to watch out for that when dealing with these things. The self is usually delivered in time. And today we live in a society where we have to have everything now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's where's my cell phone? I, have, I want to know what this is now. And, and we take the first thing that comes along. Yeah. This is happening exactly within the world of the paranormal when we've got a group of people who, who are involved when, with looking for spirits vampires, whatever the case may be, werewolves and the Yeti and Bigfoot and everything else, they'll take the first thing that comes along because they don't wait. Right. And it's the it's the it's this process of waiting and observing that we learn. And a lot of times what I find is when Aunt Mark Great Aunt Margaret trips up and we go, um like Colombo, uh just one more question. Great Aunt Margaret does a runner. Hmm. because they've been found out at that stage. The moment that they suspect that they're, that the game's up, they're gone. Now, if it was truly great Aunt Margaret, she would have nothing to worry about, um, and the thing would be explained. But the moment that I pick up deception, that's it, game over. And, uh, and we, we will move on to the next one. Wow. That's, that's just kind of creepy in itself. So... You have millions of stories, I'm sure. And since this is our Halloween segment, I would love to hear one of the scariest stories that you've ever dealt with. And scary, whatever that means to you. But I'd like people to hear it because we all like a little chill now and then. And I would love to hear the processes you went through in your experience. Well, being involved with, with the research field, um, there's, a, there's a natural evolution in which people will find their paths. And I am certainly no exception to that because I went from investigating global affairs and global hauntings and everything else to really looking at my own land's mythology and folklore. Mm-hmm. And, and being, of course, a Halloween show, Halloween developed here in Ireland and then it moved it moved out we have we have a site uh, um, uh, an ancient Celtic site um, over in the east of the country where at Halloween and I've been there many times 
we will join um, come together as a community and we will walk up the road quietly by flaming torches um, up the road and there's hundreds and hundreds of people here and we will accumulate at the site where the ancestors returned and and this site in itself when you look at it from from a from a, a satellite perspective it looks like someone has dropped a huge stone into the landscape because there's these hmm. huge ripples that roll out from the landscape um, and uh, so we would all accumulate there and there'd be a huge fire in the middle and uh, and there'd be kids there'd be adults there'd be whatever the case may be um, even a few pet dogs and uh, then they'll, they'll split the group in two um, and one side will begin the chant that calls back the ancestors the people who have died that particular year um, and Halloween was seen um, or in fact in, in Ireland it was called Samhain and, and Samhain is seen as one of those times when the veil between the world of the living and dead is at its thinnest. Mm -hmm. So this is why we do what we do. And this harmonization between the two sides of the group ripples across the landscape, much like what I mentioned there before. And it is an awe-inspiring experience. Um, you're just there left in an absolute marvel of this all because you can, you can actually feel these things waken and uh, it, it is truly an, a, an amazing experience and that will that will last the uh, halloween experience of course our custom will, will last two to three hours before everyone starts to disperse and and, and, and do their trick-or-treating or dancing or having a few beers or whatever the case may be but uh, yeah so ireland ireland was the seat of sour uh, and uh, and over the course of time the church wanted to to move things away from from that perspective um, and, and, and brought in, of course, um, All Hallows Eve, mm -hmm. which was shortened down to Halloween. And Hollow, of course, was in reference to the, uh, the, 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 the martyrs and the, the saints. So, and, and, and then it was brought down to Halloween. And uh, so that's where we are today. But by introducing by reintroducing myself back into the mythology and the folklore, folk, folklore of the landscape, both myself and my co-author, Farmer Strain, we, we ended up devising um, a series of stories that we wanted to, to really delve into to see if there was anything that may still linger on the landscape from all those hundreds and thousands of years ago. And I got to say, on hand and heart, I've had more experiences doing this than I've had with three decades of paranormal investigating. In fact, so much more extreme that I've said to Karmic, if that ever happens again, I'm retiring. That's really? it. I don't want anything more to do with this. It was so intense. And one of these experiences that that we had, we, we wrote a book, it was called uh, Legend Seekers, and it gives um, the stories and what we experienced at the site. It also gives the GPS coordinates on how people can go about going to these locations. <laughs> this one story, this one story is the one that we held back because of the absolute danger that was involved. And, and that one never got to print. So for us, what we were told was that there was this uh, uh, mining facility on top of a mountain that was having some issues. And so much so that the mine itself was shut down. But previous to the mine being open, people lived up there. But people were being ripped out of their beds at night um, to a point where they just abandoned the houses. They, they left. So Karmic and I ended up at this location at by, with the permission of the of the quarry owner, the mine owner, and uh, and we spent our time there. Now, as the as the buildings were being built, the mine the mine structures were being built. New equipment was being brought onto site, and as the new equipment arrived on site, it stopped working. 
They took it off the site. It worked fine. And other electrical problems that they were seeing with, for instance, the, the, the owner of, of, of the property, he arrived up in his new car and he parked in the yard. And when he got out, the, one of the, the foreman had said, what's wrong with your car? The windows were going up and down. The lights were flashing all erratically. And it was making no sense. It was like there was huge short outs within the electrical system within the car. He took the car back off the site. Everything worked fine. Mm. Um, then, then whenever they opened the ground and started to dig into the mine, that's whenever people started to lose their lives. And one particular guy in uh, in particular, he was working in the tool shed with a with a flat table saw. And while he was using the table saw, he was clubbed from the back of the neck, and he fell forward. And by wanting to to help himself. He put his hand out and sawed off the four fingers on his hand. Now, on the same line from where the table saw was, there was this person, and he was being seen by multiple people. This person was walking across the yard into the, the mine property um, um, houses and would vanish. Now, no one would ever see his face. It was always his back and shoulders that they would see. And they would give chase to go into the mine property, and he's not there. But as as uh, as fate would have it, one of the uh, one of the truck drivers was living on site. He was from Italy, and he lived above in, in the rooms above the, the mine property. And as this was all going going ahead, he was noticing that things started being moved around. And he then brought in some religious icons, and um, statues of Our Lady, and some of the saints and things like that, and they were being smashed. And I don't mean smashed as in with a with a pool cue or something like that. These were being smashed to powder. It was like they were being decimated completely at the molecular level. And they brought in then there was enough was being done that they said, okay, well let's bring in the priest. So they brought the priest in. Three times they brought him in. And each time that he done an exorcism, it got worse and worse and worse. Doors were being ripped off. The door, the the, the 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 Italian guy's property was locked, and the and the place was smashed to smithereens each time they came back. And um, every time there was something to do with religious iconography or anything like that, it just triggered this whole thing off. And again, they still wouldn't believe that it was something spiritual, even after the exorcism. No, it's still still not. Now I got to a stage where the where the church itself had said look we're not going to do any more we have come across something similar to this in africa we're not doing any more now it got to the stage where they ended up bringing dogs huge massive german shepherds and rockweilers into the property because you know wanting to catch whoever the hell this was the dogs were being murdered on site and um, these were vicious animals and there were well-trained guard dogs and they were being murdered on site, one after the other. This thing did not like dogs. And this is something that we tend to see as well within Bigfoot and, 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 and things associated with the landscape and the land as well. Dogs seem to be a trigger mechanism for this. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and Skinwalker Ranch is no different. I was there, I was down in Utah in October and uh, in the Uinta Basin and and again you know they were using they were using uh, dogs there before the new owner um took over and uh, they were having issues as well it seems that the dogs are able to pick up on these things much quicker than we are mm -hmm. and because the dogs are picking up on them this is this is making these things angry and they'll take it out on the animals first um, i'm aware of of a property there down in you went to basin where the farmer went in to, to have a look at this old ranch that was next door and uh, it was up for sale so he went in left the dog outside and looked around there wasn't much to see it's a bit of a, a ruin and he came back out five minutes later and the dog his dog is turned inside out on the dirt it's that quick and you will not hear a thing and uh, so this property had offered um, of course for us well that's a great story 
So let's let's start looking into this first. So we start going back into the books, back into the manuscripts, and see what's there. And it was interesting to see that um, five and a half thousand years ago, when when our ancestors were building passage chambers and portal tombs to where exactly we're still trying to understand, but they were building these huge structures that were predating the Great Pyramids of Giza, and they didn't go on to the mountain. They built thousands of places around the mountain, but they didn't go on to the mountain. And that in itself spoke volumes because these people were very connected to the land. Mm -hmm. They, I suspect, were even aware that there was something on that mountain that we were not to mess with. And of course, as a modern day, we come along and we think, well, we can do whatever the hell we want. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a price for that. Mm -hmm. And both Karmic and I ended up then eventually on the property to see what was going to happen. Now, one of my uh, companions, of course, is my four-legged companion, Max, who is a, 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 a Dutch Shepherd, Japanese Akita mix. And he goes everywhere with me. He's absolutely fantastic. He finds the caves that I would normally walk past. And uh, and we would go caving, we would go um, diving, we would we would go canoeing. He wherever I'm going, he goes. Um, so uh, the three of us headed up to the site. Now I parked the car in the same place that the owner had parked his car, and everything was closed up. And we went for a tour of the property. Now when we came back, all my electric windows were down. In mind there's already a frost is already now starting to develop because it's getting it's getting a dark and uh, and we're, we're losing a lot of, of the light so there's no reason for me to have my windows down i i, I remember distinctly my windows were up mm -hmm. and the car was locked so now the, all the windows are down so that was the first warning bell that something was up and i have brought up some uh, some fuel for a fire um, on site as, uh, as we just rested and to see what was going to happen. And Karma, of course, um, he headed back into town again in his car. He says, I'll be back out in 20 minutes. He needed to go and get something. I can't remember what it was now. And I said, that's fine. I'm going to have a sandwich here. And my wife knows that nothing gets between me and my food. So um, I started to make my, my sandwich. And the fire was lit. And both Max and I were very comfortable. And suddenly Max starts growling into the corner of the shed. Something, he's picking up on something that I can't. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, I'm still interested in getting my sandwich ready. <laughs> yeah. Watching what's going on? Um, and the next thing to happen, and it was only within minutes, he never broke his gaze. He continued to look in the same direction and the same growl behavior for him. And suddenly it was like someone with large nails run their hands down the wall of the of the building. And it, it was a, um, a sheet sheet metal building. So you can understand the noise of that is very distinct. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew at that particular point that was a warning to me. What are you doing here? Mm -hmm. um, and, and the dog, of course, was picking up on it and everything else. And it was just at that that Karmic had come back up again. And as his lights passed around the yard and passed over the shed, everything stopped. So at that particular moment, that broke the spell of whatever this thing was. We never had any more um, from that particular place. But what we did see was that there is a potential here um, at this property for dangerous phenomena to mm -hmm. uh, manifest and could actually cause some severe problems. And it was about two, three weeks after that, uh, we were we were speaking to some people, and it turns out another quarry in Galway was having the same style of problem. It seems that when you start breaking earth, that's when these things begin, hmm. and people are being thrown to the ground at, at this old quarry, and, and, and stones are being thrown. And, and uh, huge pieces of equipment are ending up on its roof. Um, it's just unconceivable. 
and the, the power that this that this has but the landscape itself what the landscape sits on is something we have disconnected from mm -hmm. and uh, and that in itself has been a, a huge wake-up call for me and that uh, and that we need to really connect back into the land uh, that we live on and uh, and see what really is out there and experience it if, yeah if you've got the nerve for it yeah I that's why I said I don't know anything about where I live <laughs> because sometimes <laughs> sometimes it gets creepy and then it starts like manifesting in yourself like what is actually going on and then it starts and and I have yeah. too much curiosity and my my husband he is an avid ghost hunter watcher so he will be like he's yeah. so ecstatic about this interview um but he is also, you know, it's interesting when you were talking about the culture in Ireland where you guys go and you have the torches and things like that. You know, he is Mexican and his culture is also very in tuned with the spiritual world and things like that. And I think that has kind of gone away from, you know, just modern day type of things, but people who are very involved in their cultures and very in tune with what their ancestors have gone through i think it can happen to or they're more sensitive to things than people who are not and i like i try to make myself not sensitive to it because it scares me too much but that you know did anything ever happen with your dog because like you said you were scaring me the whole time with you were taking your dog with you and i'm like oh no something's gonna happen to this dog but did anything ever happen with your dog? What what happened from there when, I mean, you guys explored more or did you leave at that point? Explored, we, we did explore some more, but there was nothing, there was nothing else for the rest of the evening. I, I suspect if we were there for any length of time over the course of a week or a month, the activity would have began ramping back up again. Yeah. Because at that stage, the quarry, the quarry and mine had been closed for a year. So if that's the activity that's happening the moment we arrive, right. imagine so. how this would ramp up over the course of a month. Yeah. Um, so b both, all of us, all of us left um, within, within two hours after that, because there was nothing, there was nothing else, literally. Do you, when you go and explore these things, when something like that happens, where you obviously see this is something that's dangerous, do you usually leave and respect it and go, or do you try to see and investigate a little further what is going on because like you said it can be dangerous it really depends it, you know i would i would definitely weigh up the situation um like there was a there was this particular place that uh, that i had gone to it's not far from where i live here in the west coast and and it's it's it's, it's got this naturally raw aspect of of this uh I suppose energy of the land, if if you like, and a lot of standing stones within 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 the place, naturally selected standing stones that are mm. perfectly in line, and so it, it has this natural component to it, but it also contains one of the third deepest cave systems in Ireland. Now that, that intrigued me because when you tend to find this aspect of the energy, and you've got entrances to the underworld there we start finding connections to the old lore. So again, Max was with me. I was there on my own. And uh, we went to explore the mouth of this, of this cave. Now, in itself, it's, it's pretty dangerous to get down into because mm -hmm. it, it's just a slippy grass slope. And uh, we ended up going down into it. And he's with me everywhere. And there's only been two occasions whenever he has left me. Really? And one of them was when I was standing at the foot of that cave. Because the smell of death that was coming from it was overpowering, uh, and and I said, "What on earth is you know?" I, I was looking to see had a had a sheep fallen into this, had a cow right. fallen into this, and um, and I could see the, the cave floor, and there was nothing there. But I, I was so perplexed as to where this smell was coming from, and I turned around to look at the dog, and he was gone, and he has never ever left me like that before. Um, so that to me was a clear signal, follow him. And, and I left and I haven't been back. Um, I intend to go back, but I haven't been back yet. And the, the other time, uh, both of us were exploring a cave system. And 
to get into part of the cave system, I had to get onto my belly and, and really pull yourself through with the weight of hundreds of thousands of pounds or tons of, of, of rock above your head. So the gap in, it's, the, gap in the cave is maybe about that. So you're pulling yourself through to get to the next chamber. Mm-hmm. And within the next chamber, there are drop-offs into different cavities. And also what I noticed was on the side of the wall, on the limestone walls, there were scrape marks, claw (laughs) marks. And I think, what the hell do we have with claws that's making this, these patterns on the, on the wall and what can make patterns on limestone, you know, a good, something very, very strong. So that in itself, I was very curious about and turned around and wanted him to come in because he was there on the edge of, of this, 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 this opening to come in. He was on his stomach looking at me. And I said, come on in, come, come in. And he wouldn't come in because I could stand up straight. Everything was fine. But he turned and he left. And he would not listen to my command whatsoever. And I said, okay, I'm done here. Yeah. <laughs> and I left after <laughs> You're like, I think it's time. Because Dutch shepherds are, are big dogs. They are. Yes. They are. And yes. they're pretty... Uh-huh. Um, you know, Dutch shepherds are used in a lot of like military and things like that. So they're tough. That's right. They're tough dogs yeah. and, and they, um, they're they not usually afraid of of going into and, situations. And they're, and they're, yeah, they're notoriously yeah. intelligent as well. Yes. Or yeah. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and he's like, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to leave now. Yeah. That was probably him going, come on, let's go this way. Yeah, oh, yeah, well, that yeah. that gives me goosebumps. So I'm so glad that you told <laughs> these stories. Um, well, that is, I love that. And so tell everybody, because you have written books and you have websites and things where people can find you and learn more about this. Tell everybody what books they need to mm-hmm. go read and where they need to find you. Well, I, I would definitely start with The Influence, uh, the book that I wrote uh, some time ago. Um, it looks at, at the implications of these things coming through the veil and targeting us and seeing what our body does during that particular process and how we can turn back the clock on that to get back balance. So the influence is, is definitely one of those books that should be should be read. Excuse me. And uh, folks can, can find more information about me or some of the documentaries that I've been making at, uh, at charmstealer.com. That's charmstealer.com. And uh, there's a load of documentaries on there and um, links to books and everything else. So there's a, there's a heap of information that they can find out. I love it. My husband is going to be all over this stuff. He is so excited for this whole thing because he is like, I need, and of course he said to me today, he was like, tell him that on Wednesday night was my night to watch ghost hunters. And I said, yeah. And then you got married to a chicken who won't watch it anymore (laughs) won't let him watch it i'm like don't watch it in front of me but i love that and so everybody go there and check those out and check out the books and barry when we travel to ireland because he's military so we go he travels and has friends everywhere we need to we need to link up and see if we can there you go i mean you'll scare me that's just that's just (laughs) given but see if you can scare him but that would be really great to meet up with you and and get to talk to you about some of that stuff i love that barry thank you so much for being on today i appreciate your time and i appreciate you coming on to do this for us thank you very much absolutely absolutely and everybody have a happy halloween i hope everybody got scared and go and search ask a little tell a little for more episodes 